So I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting um, this these three webinars. It's very funny to be doing a webinar, but three times in different places with different speakers. Um, we're very keen to share with you our new platform for walkable communities, to hear from different actors around the globe who are taking action for walking, and to invite you to contribute to this open resource for cities and administrations and advocates um, across the world. We're going to start with a quick introduction and overview of the Pathways platform, its origins and our ambitions for it. And then we're going to hear from local advocates about conditions for people walking. Now, I appreciate when we're doing a, a regional um, perspective, then local is a very um, a specific thing. And obviously, we can't touch on every local uh, location. But the idea is to give us a flavor for the different, uh, the context and that advocacy perspective. And then we have three case studies to illustrate some exemplar actions which are underway to improve walking and walkability um, around this, this region. And you're very welcome to join us for any of the other webinars today. They'll be running throughout the day. Um, it's very nice to start the morning here with you in um, in this in this uh, Asian Australian region. So the the idea for the Pathways to Walkable platforms came about because, and it might seem like a while ago, but it isn't over yet, as we well know that during the COVID pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns and shelter in place orders highlighted the need for walking and the place and places to walk in communities all over the world. The pandemic also revealed a real gap in visible data about walking and spurred a number of projects within Walk21 and other organizations to look at how walking, um, uh, how we can fill that gap and what's happening. And the cities that really took action for, for, for the, the momentum, like don't waste a good crisis, that could do something for walking in their communities, or very often had plans and opportunities in place already that they could roll out in response to that. And so, we hope that this platform is going to improve the visibility of existing knowledge and celebrate the good practice that is happening and inspire more investment in walking. So we wanted to daylight the data. We wanted to um, highlight the good practices that are happening. And the focus for this, though, is that it's critical to understand that we're focusing on the governance models, the policies, the action plans, the investments and ambitions within administrations, rather than only looking at the delivery on the street. Of course, the delivery on the street is what matters, but the, the governance behind that, embedding the frameworks that ensure continued delivery and improvement of walkability in our streets is what this project is focusing on. And we want to grow momentum for more by recognizing important first steps governments can take to deliver better walking environments rather than just judging by what's happening on the street. It's really critical to embed and value walking as part of a holistic approach to how we manage our streets and public spaces, our urban life and our transport systems. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the FIA Foundation. They have uh, supported us in this work and all the partners that we um, have been putting together um, this program, which includes UN Habitat and UN Environment and the World Health Organization, amongst others, to, to build this, this program. So a few uh, slides to just outline the ambitions of the pathway. It was to recognize action being taken by governments to reward and promote towns and cities that value and invest in walking through good governance and commitment to, to change. It's also to inspire ambition, demonstrate how administrations around the world are taking action, but how they can do more. We really learned this when we had our conference in Vienna um, a few years ago now, because Vienna was already winning most livable city in the world, but they were still ambitious for how they could do more and do things differently. And then finally, we want the platform to celebrate the impact of the programs and the work that governments are doing. So showcase those good practice and those exemplar invitation, in, uh, interventions so that others can, we can, we can support that peer-to-peer -peer learning and that ambition across, across the, the region. And as I said, it's about momentum. And I, as part of the work, as I explained, we said we've been working since sort of this new uh, sort of momentum for walking has come since the pandemic. And one of those pieces has been this, um, this report, which is Walking and Cycling in Africa, Evidence and Good Practice to Inspire Action. And if you're wondering why Walk21 is doing cycling, it's because as you can see on that, uh, on that cover, 
it was a partnership between UN Habitat, UN Environment and Walk 21. And the UN Environment Programme is um, a share of the road, which is walking and cycling. Um, so we, we are picking up on that shared agenda in partnership with them. But this, this data gap, this action gap, and this was really, this report really showed, we found a survey in African cities, we found that governments learned from COVID that they could do more, that they could value walking more and were inspired to do so because of that. But they didn't have examples and best practice to learn from each other. So this was trying to capture what was happen happening in Africa, as well as capturing some of those, those data gaps. So this is the sort of evolution of the work that we're doing. And as part of putting that together in the conversations um, about the platform, this sort of captures what the platform is about, which is the big picture data, as well as those, those local examples. So you can find that report on our, on our website. Um, and uh, and some of the some of the material is captured in the platform as well. And so this is the platform Pathways to Walkable Cities, which is um, available through Walk Twenty One. And we wanted to map so people could find um, three things through this mapping. One was um, the pathway action, so the case studies which we'll hear about today. The other one was what we is these global walking indicators, the data set that needs to be made visible. And finally, because we're Walk 21 and we host the International Charter for Walking, we've captured that level of political commitment and engagement in walking as well. So firstly, the International Charter for Walking, just to take you on a quick tour of the website, I wasn't even going to try and do this uh, live as a live link. So I've just got a series of snapshots and I invite you to go and explore um, for yourselves. Um, but we're, we're mapping as people sign the charter and um, demonstrate that political commitment to the elements contained within it. And it's been signed by mayors, ministers, national transport agencies. We're talking with the National Railway um, Authority in Italy at the moment because they want to support a walkability agenda. Um, and we'll be hearing a lot more about public transport in this webinar and also by individuals um, around the world. We launched it in 2006 in Melbourne and it continues to be a guiding document for advocacy um, advocacy groups to, um, use, to use that for asking from their governments, but also for governments to understand what needs to be done. So the data question, let's touch quickly on that because it informs the, the national profiles and the, the case studies that we've, that we've got. So what the, the challenge with walking and any of you who've been around for a while, people say, oh, we don't have enough data. We don't know. We don't know what to do. We don't, we don't, we, it's too complicated. You need 270 indicators. We've got 35 indicators. What do we need to know? And the challenge around data was not trying to get out and, and, and find out everything we need to know on every street, but we decided to look at what is the available data already? What do the international data sets um, that contain the elements of good walkability tell us about walking. And so we went to the World Health Organization, we went to UN Habitat, who are collecting data for SDG 11.2, which is all about proximity to public transport. We looked at IRAP's data, the International Road Assessment Program, and we also did our own base research um, building on the WHO research where from WHO we got activity and safety data because they carry all the road safety data. And we, we launched from there to look at and analyze policies from all over the world. So we looked at what was available with a walking lens and collated, as you can see here, these radar diagrams or spider diagrams, depending on what you call them, to get it's it is just a little snapshot at a national level level for the different countries, just to see how they what the data does tell us, the available data does tell us. And so you'll find um, for the countries on the platform, this, um, this sort of initial analysis. Now we don't claim to be absolutely like data changes all the time, new information comes on board. And we've had people look at that and go, oh no, our country is better than that or that, you know, we've got something new to add there. This is an evolving program. So you are very welcome to come back to us and say, can we look at this and, and to revisit the data if you're seeing something that you want to address. But there's the policy, which is the focus for today. There's the activity levels, how much people are walking. The safety, unfortunately, is often the one people, the only one people have, which is about whether people are dying or not. And in many countries, that's a shocking statistic. 
Um, the accessibility is the proximity to public transport measure, which UN Habitat is hosting, as I said. And comfort is we've drawn from the IRAP data because that's looking at what the available infrastructure is. And in some, um, I think it's in the African continent, 82% of roads that pedestrians use don't have a sidewalk. And, and so there's, there's no comfort or safety in, uh, in something like that. Um, and then down to what this, uh, the third element in the, the Pathways platform is the good governance, good practices. And that's what we are going to have some case studies um, from our, our speakers to date to, to uh, share with us their work. And we've built this um, from the Eight Steps to Walkable Communities work that we've done, which we've done as workshops in different parts of the world. Um, and in, in our Europe Africa webinar later today, we'll be hearing from the city of Rotterdam, where we ran a series of workshops with them to help develop their, their working policy. But the reason we call it pathways and not steps, because um, steps in, suggest that you take one step, then the next one, then the next one, and then the next one. And what we determined in the process of um, looking at what was successful, what were the elements that resulted in successful good governance and therefore good practice and good delivery for walking were these eight, eight things in this program. But we didn't want to suggest that you have to start at commit and finish at invest because cities do things in different orders with same with um, with with real impact on the ground. But these eight steps are about committing. It's about that political commitment um, or the, the, the strategic commitment to do something better for, for walking, to do the research about what, where people walk, why they walk, understand the walking behaviours, involving the local community, assessing the environment, understanding the context within which people are walking and therefore what needs to be done, reviewing the policy and, and frameworks and the le legislation that determines what can be done. And some of you will know Berlin has got new laws around walking, Mexico has got new laws around mobility. Legislation, and WHO is doing a very big project on this at the moment, legislation really matters in this respect because it can limit or enable action. And then the planning phase. In, in English, we have a great expression, which is planning is everything, but the plan is nothing. And in, and in this, this part of the process, the planning phase is a critical moment for engagement across administrations, across disciplines and across different agencies within your administration to bring them on board and have that ownership for delivery. Um, and also to have a plan and, and a course of action for, for implementing. And then, of course, there's the proving. And in our eight steps guidance, we talk a lot about having one of those sort of paradigm shifting signature projects. But we all know that, and that matters, you know, the, the Times Square of New York, you know, or the um, the High Line in, uh, it's not called the High Line, the um, 1770 in Seoul, where they, they transformed um, a piece of road infrastructure. These are the big paradigm shifting perceptions about walking, but it's also all the small little pieces around the city, the acupuncture in a city, perhaps, as some people like to call it. And of course, the last thing is the investment, the commitment, the money uh, to enable delivery on the ground. And, and so these eight components uh, have and uh, what comes through from analysis of the policy and, and the actions of different cities to actually achieve impact for, for walking. And that's what frames up the pathways, um, the different uh, categories in our, in our pathways on the, on the website. And so just for me to finish before I hand over to our, our speakers, um, once you dig into the, into the website, into a country, um, this is for Vietnam, and you have the national data profile, as you can see, for the radar diagram. And then here on the left, um, a good practice example from, from that. And as we grow this and as we add case studies and contribute to that, we, um, we will be bringing forward um, more pop-up windows so you can explore those individual case studies and things and profiling them on the website. I'm just going to, we have also profiles. These are the for each region, you can see we have the different case studies and country profiles. And so finally, this is my call to you as participants um, to realize that this is not just about hearing from our speakers and going, okay, well, that's, that's walking policy from them, but this is to invite you to put your policy on the map, to submit case studies and examples, to share the good work happening in your community, 
We want to promote the pathway. We want to support peer-to-peer -peer learning and cross-disciplinary collaborations. And we are going to reward administrations and communities who are taking action. Um, it was really important to our uh, development group that it wasn't just government, but sometimes it's the community actions that are really making an impact and helping embed that process. So we invite you to think proactively about what you might bring to the platform and how we can share that and make it as meaningful as possible for you. So that's it from me for now. Thank you very much. Um, please feel free to explore as, as we go. I'm going to stop sharing and introduce um, our first speaker today. And as I was talking with them before we started, anyone who's been to a Walk 21 conference or knows how we work, we always um, work very closely in collaboration with the triangle of political will, advocacy, energy and enthusiasm and practitioner development. And so that's why it was really important for us today to hear from advocates in each of our webinars, as well as the administrations and agencies that are delivering um, for, for walking. So we're gonna to listen to our speakers. We're gonna start with Hakim, who's our um, advocate from Indonesia, from pedestrian Jogja in uh, Jogjakarta. And, and then our, our case studies, please drop questions into the chat. Um, we will have time for discussion after all the speakers and we look forward to your questions and drawing some of those common threads. Um, we can take a little short break, 90 minutes is generally a pretty comfortable webinar time, but um, after Robin has spoken, then we'll just take a couple of minutes um, for everyone to have a comfort break. And, uh, but please feel free to, to uh, put together your questions now and we can come back to them as we go. So with no more further ado from me, thank you very much for joining us. We're delighted that you, you're here and I'm very uh, happy to welcome Hakim, please. Let's hear your presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Ron. Uh, so it's my session now. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, welcoming and uh, inviting me uh, to this webinar, uh, although uh, it's uh, uh, about close, uh, about three days ago, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, really excited uh, as well as nervous, nervous actually, uh, because this is uh, my first uh, international uh, presentation uh, from, you know, from Pedestrian Jogja and my communities. But uh, let me tell my uh, story and about my uh, community. Uh, can I search me? Wait. Uh, is it seen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there's a pathway to walkable city, let me. Uh, Tell story Jogja's pathway, and uh, we're we're in Jogjakarta wondering maybe it's a long path because uh, so many things to do to uh, be a walkable city. Uh, from me, Abi Yahyakim from President. Uh, yeah, before I tell uh, my story and community, uh, there's uh, maybe I I put a uh, uh, where are we? Uh, so there's special legend of Yogyakarta. There's a province in Indonesia. Uh, and the capital city is Yogyakarta city, uh, but people uh, popular, popularly uh, called Jogja. So uh, we called ourselves pedestrian Jogja or pedes Jog. Uh, and uh, here, uh, there's a few of my friends uh, from Indonesia and Yogyakarta. Uh, thank you, my friends. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I will introduce uh, about a Stanford study a research uh, five years ago that reveals uh, Indonesians uh, are uh, the laziest worker uh, from the apa, langkah kaki. Yeah, it's only uh, 3,000 uh, path in a day. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we as Indonesian, actually, uh, it's already uh, overwhelmed about this because uh, after five years, uh, people keep talking about this uh, and keep wondering: Are we uh, is are we uh, the laziest uh, worker in the world? Uh, but uh, we can reflect it. Uh, maybe uh, for the Indonesian cities context, yeah. Uh, how about the 
mobility culture, how about the pedestrian facilities that uh, that uh, uh, make uh, we uh, lazy to to walk. Yeah. And yeah, uh, talking about mobility culture, uh, maybe I can uh, talk about uh, pedestrian facility in Yogyakarta. This is a pedestrian facility in Yogyakarta. The sidewalk. Uh, there is uh, apa ini lubang and yeah imagine uh, a bus stop a bus stop is block uh, the place pedestrian access yeah uh, this is a public transport called Trans Jogja in Yogyakarta uh, yeah it's a contradictive uh, concept yeah uh, uh, that uh, public transport and pedestrian facility should be uh, collaborate collaborative in concept but uh, this is contradictive uh, and many many more uh, context in Yogyakarta that uh, apa, make uh, people uh, doesn't have don't have uh, walking culture uh, in Yogyakarta and generally in Indonesia and many cities in Indonesia okay uh, so uh, let's uh, in pedestrian Jogja action and activity, what we, uh, what we do, uh, the picture is uh, we, apa ya, uh, this is a street, street action, lah. street action uh, about uh, we are crossing the street, uh, helping people, yeah. there's a few people that, uh, that uh, want to cross the street, but uh, it's really difficult because uh, in Indonesia uh, vehicle doesn't doesn't stop uh, at uh, crosswalk. So uh, one of uh, our action of of President Jogja is uh, helping people uh, in crosswalk and other activities. Uh, we uh, we also make discussion yeah? discussion uh, with. Uh, Another communities, uh, transportation uh, communities, uh, uh, city, uh, urban communities, and uh, disability inclusive communities, uh, and uh, another discussion, uh, online discussion, uh, offline discussion because of pandemic. And uh, yeah, uh, there's one thing uh, about uh, maybe government approach and about uh, our advocacy. Advocacy. Uh, Pedestrian Jogja uh, constantly constantly collaborate with a community called Transport for Jogja. It's a community uh, that make public transport map. Uh, there's many in uh, many Indonesia, Indonesian city, Jakarta, Bandung, and uh, 20, about 20 Indonesian city. And uh, the consciousness came from uh, the public transport operator and the government cannot make uh, public transport map properly. It's not informative. Uh, so, uh, can you imagine? This is uh, my friend, my friends. Uh, apa ya? uh, put put the map uh, at the bus stop uh, from their their own money. Uh, it's not funded by uh, government. It's uh, at the bus stop. Uh, besides uh, another our advocacy advocacy action action. Yeah, we came to uh, government uh, and yeah, make uh, some uh, present present some ideas uh, about uh, public transport and pedestrian facilities. Uh, yeah, this is one of our uh, ideas uh, that we present to uh, government about area-based uh, university, uh, Gajah Mana University in Yogyakarta. Uh, we are wondering uh, how about uh, this street? Uh, we regenerate the pedestrian uh, pedestrian walk, and uh, another street. Uh, we make we make uh, another uh, bus stop, another bus stop, and and many more crosswalk. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, in Indonesia, pedestrian Jogja actually uh, is a member of uh, Koalisi Berjalan Kaki or Pedestrian Coalition. Uh, so pedestrian Jogja is a uh, Yogyakarta member. Uh, there are also another city member, uh, Jakarta, Bandung, uh, Palembang, uh, Banjarmasin, uh, that 
uh, advocate every government, every regency or city government to make rencana induk fasilitas pejalan kaki or pedestrian facilities master plan. So we're wondering and we advocate uh, how about uh, every uh, agency and city uh, make pedestrian facility uh, facilities master plan that uh, span uh, maybe a long span uh, 20 years or uh, 30 years yeah uh, that uh, uh, apa yeah actually uh, yeah I forgot. okay uh, and another our street action our uh, street action uh, this is actually uh, support the campaign of walk 21 ireland uh, Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, three months ago, yeah, three months ago, uh, we uh, print print it and uh, we bring it uh, to our our street action. Uh, this is active places for people. Uh, when we we are uh, we are we came to uh, a promenade. Uh, it's a uh, edge of uh, river yeah, uh, that uh, that can make. Uh, active places for people uh, doing anything, and uh, this is uh, also a sub sub campaign uh, from World 21 Ireland, including all people walking. Yeah, we also bring it uh, to uh, our uh, activity, and this is another another uh, apa? Uh, apa apa ya? Yeah, another uh, printed. Uh, pedestrian matters uh, kota butuh ruang publik is uh, city needs uh, public space uh, and also uh, related to uh, environment uh, we support uh, SDGs walking is a climate action and saya berjalan kaki berjalan uh, di trotoar is I am pedestrian uh, walk uh, on the sidewalk uh, beside uh, there's many motorcycle and uh, car uh, that that uh, in uh, sidewalk too Uh, so uh, this is koalisi pejalan kaki that I told you about uh, pedestrian coalition uh, in Indonesia. So uh, we are also a network uh, KPK in Indonesia. It's uh, include uh, pedestrian Jogja, uh, KPK Surabaya, pedestrian coalition in Surabaya, pedestrian coalition and uh, Banjarmasin. That uh, so many uh, uh, advocacy community uh, in Indonesian city. And uh, last. Uh, Thank you from us. Uh, this is our uh, social media, uh, Pedestrian Jogja. Uh, let's follow. Uh, besides, uh, we have also uh, Pedestrian uh, Facebook account and YouTube account uh, to see uh, our video and content. Maybe uh, thank you uh, from me. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Hakim. It's really great to see. And I think your opening slides capture it. It's like, To, to suggest that you're the laziest and then you look at the conditions in which you are being asked to asked to uh, to choose to walk is not uh, is not automatically inducive but it's great to see the coalitions the partnerships that you're building and the work um, that you're doing there so thank you so much for that um, we're going to move straight now to our uh, first case study which um I personally am delighted, those who knew, know me, I uh, used to work in Brisbane and when I left 20 something years ago now, it uh, the, the, I moved across the world to work on walking because we couldn't even get traction or get the idea up amongst the administration. And now they have a strategy and now we're two years into implementation um, of that strategy. So I'm delighted that Robin Davies, who's the manager of the walking and cycling in the Department of Transport and Main Roads in Queensland, which is a regional government, Um, is here to share update on report on the progress of the Queensland walking strategy. So thank you so much, Robin, over to you. Thank you, Bron, thank you so much. And uh, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. Can you see my Yeah, that's great, thank you. Now? Yeah, looking very, so, very Queensland. <laughs> It is a little Queensland, there's some good hats there. And thank you, Hakim. It's incredibly inspiring work that you're doing. Also, there's uh, in Mexico City has a pedestrian superhero who does uh, something a little similar, helping people cross roads. So he's called Pietro Neto, and <laughs> that sounds like you're being very much the superheroes for pedestrians as well. So 
thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Uh, if I can just first uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which I join you today. Uh, that's the so I acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagera peoples and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge any First Nations people who are joining us today. Uh, I won't play this video, but I will put a little link to it in the next, um, in, in the chat. It just tells you a little bit about transport and main roads and the work that we do, but it just takes a little bit of bandwidth. So uh, a very quick overview. I'll talk about the, the Queensland walking strategy, the foundations that we've built on the actions, some of the actions that we're working on and the learnings, some of the learnings that we've had from that work. Where are we at now? Uh, Walking is you know, clearly uh, so important, so central for transport, recreation and health, uh, and so many cross-sectoral benefits. It's the number one form of recreation. Uh, most of the trips to public transport are by walking, uh, but only 10% of all trips are by walking. And there's a lot of uh, low hanging fruit. There's a lot of low, short car journeys that we could shift, but also people tell us there's a lot of barriers to making that shift. So. Uh, that you know, we need more paths, more crossings, more shade, especially in the hot Queensland weather, uh, more separation from cars, and you know we're facing that limited planning and funding for walking. So those are some of the barriers that we're trying to address. And the way, um, so the, so what we have done is uh, the Queensland government in 2019 released the first Queensland walking strategy. I see Jereen Schwart is online from Transform Planning and she was very much involved in the development of this strategy. Uh, it's a, so we have a 10 year strategy that sets the vision, priorities and action areas for walking. And then the, the first two year action plan was 2019 to 21. And we also have a baseline report from which we are measuring our progress. Uh, so the release of that strategy in uh, 2019 was very much the end of the beginning, if you like. Uh, it was a very long sought initiative and a great success story for advocacy in our state in that it came out of a 2017 election commitment that was sought by Queensland Walks, which is our equivalent of the Pedest Jogger. <laughs> so Queensland Walks, I see Anna Campbell's also online from Queensland Walks. Um, and this strategy was informed by really extensive public consultation and a huge walking summit. And that developed the vision and those priority areas that you can see on the screen. And the first action plan, the first two year action plan. So very briefly, the, it really laid the foundations for the for the next set of work. It's, it's established a lot of the coordination and cooperation that's needed for implementing the strategy. It's really raised the visibility and profile of walking both in state government and with local government. It's given for us at the state level, a lot of legitimacy that we, we walking is part of what we do now, although how we then <laughs> make that happen is, is still a work in progress. It's given us resources. So my colleagues, Lee Gamble, Alana Plummer and Andrew Ross are working on very hard on implementing the, the next action plan we'll talk about in a moment. And, and, the, and the first action plan established the walking network planning process, but it, it was very much just a start. And, and then there was COVID uh, and that really did give a boost to walking and cycling and gave you know, across the world, I think it's a common story um, that uh, it, it's, it's been a, it, it increased the amount of people walking, the number of trips, and it's had an ongoing effect, particularly in around people's local neighborhoods. So the, so we now have uh, released uh, the next action plan for walking. So that was released in May this year. It's got 35 new actions, involves 10 state government agencies. So it's, you know, it really reflects how much walking affects a lot of portfolios and delivers a lot of benefits across so much of the work of the state government at the state government level. Uh, and so I'll just walk you through some of the the four, the actions under the four action areas. So the first action area of, obviously is planning. So we've got 
uh, movement in place uh, policy that's in development. We're doing more walking that we're planning. Uh, and we've got the Brisbane 2032 Olympics and Paralympic Games as a, I guess, a focus for some of our work over the next 10 years. So we're very lucky in that regard. But I would just focus on a couple of the really important actions that have arisen out of that, out of this action plan. The first is the local government grants. So for the first time, we've been able to offer walking network planning grants to our local government partners, 50-50 funding. Um, they've, the message that we got from our pilot walking network planning processes was that local governments have quite a lot of uh, grant programs that they can apply to to build infrastructure, but they didn't have the network planning or the works planning or the, the list of projects in the bottom drawer that you could pull out and say, oh, there's grants, we can put in this project for it. And so that's, so in response to that, our first uh, foray into grants was to do, uh, to focus on network planning. It also happens to be very good value for money and the average grant size was about $20,000. Uh, so matched with the local government funding. So there's now 48, uh, projects from, from 23 local governments. That's nearly a third of our local governments in Queensland that applied for the grant funding. So it's incredibly popular. And you can see that that's spread all over Queensland. Um, and that's to do walking network planning around catchments for schools, public transport and so on. We've also been doing that same kind of work around state government uh, focused infrastructure. and. I think that the learning that we've had is for, it's often the first, this is a very community based um, process that we use for planning. And it's often the first time that the local government, state government and community stakeholders have been on the ground working together, looking at how to improve this environment for walking specifically. And it's really eye opening and often incredibly transformative for people particularly politicians who don't realise how many low-hanging fruit there, there are, you know, things that can barely easily be done to improve uh, the conditions for walking. The building action area is the next action area. I noticed in the uh, Pathways to Walkable Cities, Bron, that you've picked up the smart crossings as one of your case studies, so that's very nice. Um, so we've got uh, quite a few action speed limits, obviously a big one, so making it easier to uh, reduce speed limits. Um, also, fo some focus on ecotourism and and how to deal with the the kind of growing, I guess, conflict on footpaths between personal the the e-scooters e and pedestrians. The third area is encouragement, and so you know, around schools, ten thousand steps type initiatives, uh, and. I think one of the, the things, one of the areas that I want to highlight, one of the actions I want to highlight here is that we've started a, uh, a walking infrastructure masterclass. Again, a few of my colleagues online, Mark McDonald and, and Jareen are very involved in delivering that training course. It's two days, it's really transformative again for the people involved that come out very skilled in identifying how to improve walking environments uh, and, and go back to uh, their communities to to and and to their workplaces to spread uh, that or to to help others to uh, make the changes. It's really eye opening, uh, but fairly simple kind of work that um, that you know, but but very transformative. So the the final area action area is working together, and and so. The, that action area talks about the two and a half million dollar investment over two years. But the thing, I, and an, an active transport infrastructure policy, which is in development. But the thing I wanted to emphasize was this. So the Queensland government supports at Queensland Walks to, uh, to, do, to, do, to, to develop the Queensland Walking Alliance, to run Queensland Walks Months, develop an, an online hub and, and then to, basically be a voice for walking. And what Queensland Walks has done with the Walking Alliance is to bring together so far 30 plus organisations that have an interest and a stake in promoting walking and 
collectively they represent, they reach out to about half a million of the four million Queenslanders. So it gives them massive voice to walking and a real way of amplifying that voice across the state and to decision makers. So a shout out to Anna for the hard work that you've put in to establish that network and also the work that you're doing to establish, I guess, policies or action statements out of that that are agreed across those organisations. An incredibly powerful uh, way of working. So just to some the so some of those that, that network planning and that is is helping to replace that ad hoc approach to investment. We're building that capability and that voice within our own organisations and creating that collective voice for through the Queensland Walking Alliance. Those are some of the most effective things that we're doing that have been given I guess a, a platform by the overarching Queensland Walking Strategy and Action Plan. So I will finish there and hand over back to you, Bron. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Robin. It's fantastic to see this, to see the development. And um, there's a very interesting uh, loop there between the advocates getting government to do something and then the government's coming back to the advocates and supporting them to be part of that ambition and to grow those alliances. It's really, and we see that in a couple of places as well, where um, advocacy agencies are being enabled by governments in Scotland in particular, they're actually their delivery agency on, on a lot of their programs. Um, and so they're building slightly different styles of partnership as well. So it's really interesting to see the work and to see, again, that real embedding of, of the walking and, and the liberation that the strategy brings in terms of releasing resources and ambition and things. And the last thing I really wanted to pick up from your presentation as we, we move forward is the fact that you're for the first time you're transforming really th this simple thing of just going for a walk in your local community to to transform the way people per perceive that um there is a, a question in the chat from Bootsy around the master classes um we can come back to that in the discussion but you might like to pick it up as well while we move on to the next speaker and i'm really uh delighted to in introduce um, Pao Ping, who is the Principal Manager of Active Mobility Planning and the Active Mobility Group um, from the Singapore Land Transport Authority. And it is a slightly different scale of city to uh, and style of city, but they're doing some really inspirational work. So um, Pao Ping, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thanks, Bron. Yeah, um, I'm Pripping from Land Transport Authority Singapore. Today, I'm very glad to share with you our Walk Cycle Ride or WCR strategy uh, that Singapore has adopted to make it an efficient uh, land transport system. Uh, eh? Sorry, not able to. Okay, before I begin, uh, let me share a little um, background about Singapore. Uh, not too sure whether um, all of you have uh, visited Singapore before, but Singapore is a small island city state, highly dense, uh, highly populated, very dense. Uh, because we are very small, but we have uh, almost a uh, 5.5 million uh, population situate, uh, res, re, uh, reside in uh, Singapore over here. And this, um, <clears throat> compared to, uh, if you can see, we have done a comparison of the size uh, between Singapore and London, New York City and Hong Kong. Uh, these, all these cities are actually uh, almost 1.5 to 2 times bigger than us. Uh, so with such a small uh, uh, land area that we have about 728 square kilometers, we need to balance all the needs uh, for commerce, uh, for industry, airport, uh, res re residential, as well as transport. So today, um, about 12% of our land has already been taken up by transport. So uh, with this highly dense, uh, dense dense uh, populated city, uh, we cannot afford to keep on expanding uh, our transport system uh, as we grow. So we have to think of a more efficient manner. So uh, Singapore adopted uh, uh, the 
uh, public transport uh, as well as active mobility transport, a uh, hand in hand strategy, the walk cycle ride strategy that we have. So for uh, buses, we have over uh, 5,700 uh, buses, uh, almost 300, uh, more than 310 bus routes that travel uh, every day. Uh, for rail, we have uh, 245 kilometers with around uh, 189 stations in total. And we also have uh, point to point uh, public, uh, private hire cars uh, and taxi to support the overall public transport uh, system. Under our LTMP 2040, that's our Land Transport Master Plan 2040, uh, LTA promotes walk, cycle, ride as the preferred travel modes in Singapore. So we hope to achieve our 20 minutes towns uh, using uh, our walk, cycle, ride modes um, where possible, as well as a 45 minute city where 9 in 10 uh, peak period uh, travels journeys uh, are using walk, cycle, ride modes as well. Yeah, so uh, walk, cycle, ride modes are the preferred way to travel. This is something that we hope to achieve. So we marry the two, public transport and active mobility together to form the walk cycle ride vision. So uh, it, it, it comprises both the first and last mile where we integrate with the public transport system as well as the full trip itself. Uh, MRT station mass from uh, rapid transport uh, or the LRT, uh, the light rail transport, actually form the backbone of our public transport system. Today, we have uh, six lines uh, uh, with TEL being the latest and we are uh, building and studying uh, two other lines, Jurong Region Line as well as the Cross Island Line. Um, so this form uh, a network of uh, MRT uh, station, uh, public transport system in Singapore. We also expand uh, on our bus measures. Uh, for example, we are creating more and more of the transit priority corridor, what we call the TPC, uh, that encompasses a suite of uh, bus priority uh, measure. For example, um, uh, that dedicated lane for the buses or signal priority that give uh, priority to buses to uh, have the green light uh, ahead of the other vehicles. Uh, this uh, we have integrated with the local land use also to cater for the sustainable uh, mode of active uh, modes of transport together. Right. Uh, one example of the transit party corridor that uh, recently we have been developing is the north-south corridor running north to the south of Singapore, spanning uh, about 21.5 kilometers uh, that links the northern portion of uh, Singapore to the city. So uh, in this transit party corridor, there are several features including dedicated bus lane, uh, uh, cycling tram routes and pedestrian, wider pedestrian path uh, as well as inclusive of uh, the vegetation greenery along the whole route that uh, allow uh, both the walk, uh, the walk cycle ride uh, to happen. Beside the infrastructure, uh, we have also been uh, developing on the um, uh, similar uh, integrated um, uh, fare system, for example, uh, this is a distance based fare where previously when you uh, check, check in and check out from one system, for example, the MRT station and you then you take uh, the uh, bus transport, uh, you will need to pay, uh, you will need to pay uh, more than what it is now, where it is an integrated system that you will need to, you will, uh, when you make transfer, uh, the main aim of this is to facilitate a uh, seamless transfer and encourage people to make more transfer if it is more logical, right? Uh, we are also uh, developing uh, integrated um, transport uh, system uh, to make the transfer more seamless where possible. So the, this, uh, what I refer to integrated transport hub, 
uh, you can find both. Uh, so usually, you will find uh, the MRT system, a bus interchange, as well as some commercial uh, nodes, uh, commercial shops, uh, as well as sometimes it's integrated with uh, residential. So all these um, make the transfer um, more convenient, and people are able to do a uh, trip chaining along uh, along their journeys. Okay. Uh, we also take into consideration uh, how to make it more walking and cycling friendly where we design a new housing estate as well as retrofitting the existing housing estates that we have. So for example, uh, uh, with the rail network expansion, uh, we will also build an extensive uh, covered link way uh, connection from the MRT nodes uh, to the nearest uh, bus stop, for example, or the nearest key amenities. Given that Singapore is a uh, uh, hot and uh, humid weather, so Covered Link Way will uh, give the commuters uh, shelters uh, during a hot uh, or a rainy day. So uh, Covered Link Ways are very important to us, right? So these take care of uh, uh, the commuters while walking. For cycling, we are also doing a dedicated cycling path where possible. Uh, it forms a network within the town, and beyond that, it will link. Uh, it will link between towns and link to the city. So uh, we are targeting to build uh, uh, around a one thousand three hundred kilometers of cycling path by twenty thirty. So uh, for Singapore walking experience, uh, we have crossed uh, up to 6,000 kilometers of footpath. In fact, you can find a uh, footpath along uh, most of our roads. So uh, both sides of both sides of the roads, right? So uh, therefore it already form part of the standard route cross, uh, cross section uh, for Singapore, uh, right? To, uh, we also try to enhance the walking experience uh, through using greenery, uh, tree planting to provide additional shade uh, in our uh, climate, as I've mentioned, uh, on top of the covered link ways. Um, comfort and barrier free accessibility is also important as we have uh, more and more of the elderly population. So uh, we, we are adding leaf to our pedestrian overhead bridge to make it more barrier free. And uh, we are putting in more aggregate crossing to facilitate their crossing uh, wherever possible. So this photo here shows you uh, the overall Singapore walking landscape that we have. Uh, the one on the top left corner is uh, our typical housing estate showing that at the ground floor level is actually very porous so uh, people can walk through uh, at the ground floor there isn't any uh, fans or gates uh, that this allow people to walk through at the ground floor level uh, we also have um, um, covered link ways linking to key amenities like what I've mentioned before. So on the second photos on the left, uh, covered link way linking to neighborhood market and food center. And this is the bus stop, right? Um, and the picture, the third pictures on the left bottom uh, is showing a typical treatment of a silver zone. Uh, where we intentionally slow down the speed of the vehicle through traffic calming measures like chicane uh, or um, cup cup ramps uh, to facilitate uh, crossing of uh, pedestrian, uh, separating them into two stages, right, and making it safer for everyone. The one on top, uh, middle top, uh, is a bicycle crossing. Uh, where we have uh, widened the pedestrian crossing to another three meters to accommodate uh, uh, bicycles and other active mobility device users. So they operate on the same um, pedestrian traffic signal, right? So they will go green together and with all the uh, vehicles stopping at the side. The picture on the right hand side shows the elevated uh, network. Actually, uh, uh, the three pictures on the right should be uh, read together. Uh, they are the, the this uh, this pictures is showing Orchard Road, which is one of the busiest uh, 
commercial stretch that we have uh, with a lot of tourists uh, 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 and also the daily commuters. So uh, it is actually showing uh, the various uh, level, the different tiers, great at grade, uh, grade sep and grade separated network that we have. So in, in areas such as these, we have duplicated networks because of the heavy pedestrian flow and also to facilitate our movements of pedestrians safely across the streets. So seamless and barrier-free accessibility is very important, uh, especially at the transport node. So uh, today, all MRT station, bus interchange and integrated transport hub have at least one barrier-free accessible route. So they are demarcated with the tactiles uh, and also uh, leave for uh, the these uh, uh, people to use. And also we have uh, wider gates, wider tapping tap out gates uh, for them. Uh, for bus system, uh, we, we even have wheelchair accessible buses, meaning that, uh, that it is uh, the step that you uh, take to take a bus, right, is actually lowered uh, so that it's almost the same height as the curb at the side, right? So uh, we, we call that um, uh, barrier free and wheelchair accessible public buses, okay? And uh, on the right hand side, you can see that it is a next generation uh, passenger information display system where we inform uh, users uh, about the, uh, the time where the uh, bus, buses will arrive um, and when is the next stop and so on. Uh, some even have uh, indications showing whether uh, the buses uh, uh, is heavily loaded with passenger or not with the traffic light system, what we call the green, amber, red colors to indicate whether it is, um, uh, it is full or not, right? Uh, so this, uh, with the timing that uh, that's being shown here, uh, people can make an uh, informed decision uh, how to make seamless transfer uh, between MRT station or maybe the next uh, type of transport system that they wish to uh, use. Okay, uh, more and more uh, in recent development, we are looking into repurposing uh, road space uh, that means taking away road lanes uh, for the various users shown here. The first one, of course, active mobility. So uh, along Bankulan Street that, uh, that has been shown in this picture here, we have reclaimed uh, two lanes uh, from the roads and make a wider space for footpath and uh, a dedicated path for cycling. And also uh, there are spaces uh, for uh, mingling. Uh, there are seats uh, that's designed by the students uh, uh, in the Education Institute uh, and also uh, bicycle parking. In the center picture, uh, we also reclaim space for pedestrianized street and community uh, spaces. Uh, this is to inject uh, more activities to keep the streets more lively and attractive. And the last one, transit party corridor, just like I've shared before, uh, we also reclaim space for additional uh, bus lane, dedicated bus lane to facilitate public transport system. So all in all, we have already identified 60 project island wide to uh, convert uh, road space into this facility to uh, support our walk cycle ride vision. In, in summary, uh, walk cycle ride travel modes are at the core of our Singapore Land Transport Master Plan. So uh, we focus on multimodal integration and enhancing uh, commuting uh, experience. Uh, so uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It, uh, I know Singapore is a very dense city and it gives you a lot of motivation to actually make the most efficient um, use of the, the space you have available. But that is, that is a great demonstration of a comprehensive integration of active mobility with public transport, which is an essential, as we call it, journey extender for people on foot. And I just wanted to highlight one particular thing that you that you said, which was you talked about silver zones. And just to clarify for listeners that this is for elderly people in the community. So you're extending crossing times and making it safer for um, el uh the whole spectrum of people uh, in your community to be able to walk and access their, their their local environments. So thank you so much for that. I think there's it's it would be easy to say, well, that's Singapore, they have the density, they can do that. But the principles of what you're doing apply to all cities in terms of meeting the needs of all the different user groups, 
fully integrating the experience and then the retrofitting, the new, the new build, the retrofit and the repurposing of road space. It's a fantastic package. So thank you so much for, for that. That's really great. And so to our final speaker, who's going to be focusing on the smallest members of our community, or not quite the smallest, but the, 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 on the journey to school. And um, I'm really delighted to uh, invite Rohit Tuck. He's an urban designer and mobility planning professional. He's worked with WRI in India on the work that he's going to share today about improvements to school streets in Mumbai. So over to you, Rohit. Rohit, thank you. Sure, thank you, Ronwa, and I'm just sharing my screen. Um, We're almost there. Yeah, great. There we go. Okay, it's um, it's still in work mode rather than presentation mode, but use mm -hmm. it as it works best for you. Yep. All good? Great. There we are. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Um, so as uh, Ron just mentioned, that I'm talking about Safe Access to Schools initiative and presenting a case study from Mumbai. It's a pretty lot of information that I'm sharing, so I'll directly dive into it. I'll start with the quote that for cities to thrive, the children in the cities must thrive. So uh, what does it exactly mean? So with cities rapidly urbanizing, um, the way we plan, design, and build urban environment plays a crucial role in ensuring children's well-being, uh, their mental and physical growth, and safety as they access city and uh, make their lifestyle, lifestyle choices as they grow up. And for the city should, should be fully developed um, to allow children to experience the urban environment with all the potential that interaction with the city can offer. And children are, the, like I said, they're the future citizen. The key words here for uh, us to plan our cities, putting them at the center are to allow them um, uh, urban spaces um, to explore, to learn, to en enrich their experience as they interact with the city, um, to introduce walkability, add stress on accessibility. And um, the core of it is safety. And more specifically, uh, from the point of view of my presentation, road safety. This is the situation of uh, children and road safety in the context of India. So um, in India, you know, we, we are a home of uh, 472 million children between the age group zero to 18. And currently 27% of these children live in cities. And uh, this number is bound to increase as uh, by 2030, 40% of India's population will be living in cities. So we have like this huge number of children who are going to be citizens, who are going to be make their lifestyle choices to take care of uh, while they are so young. Uh, in terms of um, the, the fatalities and road crashes scenario, um, the sad situation is that every day 31 children die on Indian streets. Um, and 40% 40, 40 of um, these fatalities happen on urban streets. So we have to focus on how we plan our urban streets. So that's where um, the, this project initiated. Um, you know, school is one such destination that children um, access on a daily basis. Um, children spend around 1,500 hours per year in schools, and a significant amount of time is spent in commuting to schools. What you see on the screen is a situation in Mumbai, like these school girls are trying to cross the street without have, uh, you know, a, an intersection which doesn't have safer pedestrian infrastructure for them to cross. You can't even notice crossings there. And do we really want our children to commute to school um, uh, to, to acquire education in such an environment? Um, and so the, so the principle that we started with is that ac access to education is a right of every child, so should be safe access to schools. With this um, principle, um, the project initiated with the goal to introduce safe access to schools in Mumbai, to encourage children to walk to school through evidence-based approach involving road safety data assessment, demonstration of child-friendly street designs um, using tactical urbanism as a tool, and introduction of policy uh, programs to scale up the efforts. Um, this uh, project was initiated uh, as the, you know, with WRI as the knowledge partner and the project lead. Um, under Bloomberg Initiative for Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Global Road Safety and 3M Partnership, with implementation partner as um, the Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai or um, the Corporation of Mumbai. 
Um, the process involved three staged approach. First is count it, change it, and third is scale it. So count it involved comprehensive road safety data assessment um, uh, around schools in Mumbai to understand the gravity of situation. Because if we are talking to policymakers, we are talking to police, politicians, this um, helped us to show what kind of impact providing safer access to schools or walkable infrastructure around school can have on in, the, in general safety in the city. Um, second was change it, uh, which involved um, a bottom-up approach of um, taking one case example to um, showcase what the change would look like using preliminary measures, demonstrations, tactical urbanism, short-term measures to galvanize policymakers and politicians. And third was scale it, which um, where um, the idea was to positively impact the policymakers through guidance, toolkits, um, through um, institutionalizing uh, programs uh, for maximizing the impact and the objectives. So first we'll talk about um, the counted approach. So Mumbai is a home for 3,685 uh, 3, schools um, and 2,000, 610 school campuses. Um, as you see on the map of Mumbai, the blue dots are the schools. There's every part of the city has um, a school. Um, and if you draw like a 500 meters bed shed or walk shed um, around those schools, you've noticed that 60% of Mumbai's roads provide access to schools or they are within the walkable radius um, of the schools. And if you superimpose that with the road safety crash data, the sad situation is that 71% of fatal crashes, um, they happen within those 500 meters walk shed of the schools and 84% of the numbers include vulnerable road users, that is your uh, pedestrians, cyclists, and motor motorcyclists. And um, within that, 28% of the school, that is 470 schools have more than three fatalities within 500 meters of bed shed that occur um, in the last three years. So this data helped us um, push for the project by putting children at the center, but looking at the larger aspect of making city and streets in the city safer for all users. Um, and to, to then demonstrate the change to galvanize the change makers, um, we, we picked up Christchurch School um, in Baikal neighborhood of Mumbai as a case study. Um, uh, you know, one, one aspect about this school is that 42% of the students in this school walked to school. Uh, but the situation, if you see in this video, which I'm like playing, I'm, I hope it's visible. Um, this is how the situation is around the school during the assembly and departure hours. This is a subarterial road, um, so it's not having as much traffic as other streets would have, but still you see the congestion, still you see a lot of activities that are happening around the school's gates. Um, you know, they are um, sort of uh, contributing um, to an unsafe environment for children to a walk and we cross the street. Now, these are the main um, stakeholders that we worked with um, at the governance level, um, the implementation body, that is the Corporation of Greater Mumbai, um, the, and the politicians who are the community leaders. So introduced the data to them, introduced the approach to them, and created buy-in to, to further um, move to the next stakeholders that, uh, that, are, that are the um, schools management, uh, we introduced our project to them, and then we got access to school children and their parents and teachers um, association. So uh, that's uh, this this process helped us understand what exactly the end users want. So a walk around the school with children with these frames helped us understand if we are walking uh, with them, what do they see at their eye level? Because Remember, children have different anthropometry, their heights are different, their um, cognitive skills are developing. So the way they see, the way they react to urban environment is different than adults. The way they, uh, what they see at the height of, um, of 1.2 meters or, um, you know, four feet is different than six feet. So how to include that in design? Um, so this exercise helped us. Second was, um, you know, focus group discussion and activities to understand what children want to see on their school street. So these exercises also helped us to understand what different age group of children 
uh, who have, of course, as I mentioned, different heights, different cognitive skills, have um, expectations from, from the streets uh, which are around their schools. Uh, for example, between six to nine age group, um, children have, after, after we, we noticed or we um, uh, the data we collected, we uh, understood that children have affinity to natural features such as trees, flowers, uh, bright colors, etc. cetera. Uh, between age group 10 to 12, they are likely um, to walk and play in a group of two to three. Um, and between age group 13 to 16, uh, this age group is like more um, grown up um, and they prefer, uh, you know, walking uh, uh, to school uh, on their own. They prefer comfortable shared spaces for pauses um, uh, as they walk to school. So these in this information was very helpful for us to further um, delineate, define the school zone. Um, that's what we did here. We found um, two uh, major nodes around the schools. One is an intersection, one is a transit stop. So it's approximately 200 meters length of um, the street stretch that we selected to transform into a safer school zone with principles such as channelization of um, the vehicular movement, regulation of um, speeds of the vehicles. So we introduce speed limit to make sure that um, the environment on the street is safer. Um, we also introduce uh, mid-block crossings, regulated pedestrian movement where it should happen, uh, where it's actually required. Um, then organized edges around the street to accommodate the ancillary activities um, uh, which happen next to the school gates, the, the vending, the um, waiting of parents to pick up their kids, parking, etc. cetera. Um, we allocated spaces on the sidewalk which are unhindered and, um, uh, and, and uh, contiguous uh, walkable paths. And lastly, activated the school zone to let all the vehicle users know that they're entering in a zone which is um, designed with or which, which has children as a priority users. Um, and this activation was done at grid, so at surface level with interactive paving patterns, interactive, um, uh, you know, uh, guide strips, et cetera. At eye level or above grade uh, with signage, with street furniture, and uh, at the edge of the street, um, we activated um, it using murals, um, read the ground floor retail, how the built form interacts with this uh, public right of way was kept in mind to create an envelope of a school zone that is safer, vibrant, accessible, walkable for all users with children as the center, at the center. Um, and then this design on paper was transformed um, using tactical urbanism tools overnight and with the help of children. And one of the goals was to, to empower them as change makers, like every day when they're walking to school, they see that they have transformed the streets. So including children, not just in the planning process, but also in transformation process was also a goal here. Um, and this is how the school zone looked like when it was transformed. It was safe, it was uh, walkable, accessible, vibrant, and playful. Um, we also did impact assessment, and I'm not going to read a lot of um, this information, but uh, the, the crux was that the pedestrian count increased. Elderly people walking on the sidewalk increased during the, the trial period, uh, which was of uh, 12 days. Um, the pedestrian behavior was also positive. Each and every element that we introduced within the 200 meters of the school zone had positive impact. For example, the signage helped users understand that they're entering this, uh, a zone which is um, a school zone. Uh, vibrant crossings helped them to slow down uh, for motorists to comply um, with, with um, you know, uh, the pedestrian crossings. Um, people, uh, st students got to know where to wait, how to wait. Um, so the, this data helped us to push for permanent implementation of the project and further to the next step, that is to, to scale up this initiative at the city level. And um, there are three components of scale up, the media, community, and policymakers and politicians. So the project was highly, highly covered by all media, and I'm just showing English language media here, but the um, vernacular language, the local language, uh, also spoke about this initiative and how, how important it is um, for, for a city like Mumbai. Um, and throughout this um, coverage, um, a lot of positive um, vibe around this approach was generated um, from the, you know, from the, a lot of inputs to in this me uh, media coverage was given by the local community. So there was a buy-in from the community for it. So that was 
that's when we realize that this is going to be a success, that community wants this. So the project is not just going to stop at tactical urbanism trial, but it's, it will be implemented. This, uh, the children were kind were pushing for it, like we want safe access to schools, we want child-friendly streets, and this kind of helped us to um, advance our um, uh, impact and objectives of the project. And as a result, the policymakers recently launched um, a safe access to school program. It's called Majishara Surakshit Shara, it's in uh, Marathi language, um, for the city of Mumbai and allocated 6.5 million for implementing child-friendly school zones, around 50 schools in Mumbai. So out of the schools, they have selected 50 in the first phase. Uh, which will be transformed into safer school zones. And um, as a re result of it, um, the state government has also um, initiated a statewide competition to call for, um, for other cities to submit proposals um, or design uh, proposals um, uh, in their cities um, to implement safe access to schools. Um, and this was uh, you know, the success of um, this initiative and which currently is ongoing um, as I'm speaking. And lastly, I'll just um, you know, quote Enrique Penalosa, that children are kind of indicator species. If we, um, if we can build a successful city for children, we will have a successful city for everyone. And similarly, walkable, accessible, and safer streets for children are always safer streets for all. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rohit. That's a really comprehensive story. And I think what I particularly love about this story is that it it transfers from being um, an international agency led um, intervention that has led to local take up and um, commitment in an ongoing fashion. Um, again, a slightly different agenda. Now, Queensland came from an advocacy and through a political agenda. You brought the resources and the expertise of those international agencies into a local context, and they've embraced it and and taken that forward in a really constructive way. I think the other thing I particularly like is that you can't do walkability without doing safety. I mean, 31 children every day. I mean, the statistics are terrifying when you, you look into some of these communities and it's not, but what I really find important and especially in the work is that you can do everything with the same money. You can make it safer and nicer and more accessible and, and more efficient and, and all of those things. And that's what the work that you're, um, that, that you've shown with that fantastic uh, example um, and that that's leading and, and the importance of media engagement, which is sort of where we started with our with Hakim and, and the importance of social media and campaigns to to reach out. And uh, I think um, that's been a really lovely, comprehensive package of of different, very different cities, different projects, but touching on those core elements of resourcing and investment and coalitions and addressing safety, the different user groups, the connections with public transport. And uh, to finish my, on, on your, my comments, particularly on your presentation, was that once you start drawing catchments around schools, you find that actually you're covering a very large amount of the streets um, in the city. And, and uh, uh, in Singapore, we saw that not only are they connecting people to the stations, but by building those connections, they're connecting them to the local destinations. Um, more broadly within that community as well. And I think this sort of coming together of, of answering multiple questions with this investment in walking has been, is one of walking superpowers, you know, that you can address so many elements in, in the same time. Um, I'm just wondering, I, we have now about 10 minutes and uh, I'd really like it. People have been putting questions in the chat and that's really lovely to see. If you have a particular question that you would like to bring to this group, um, please drop it into the chat now. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll lead off though. And I've captured there a little bit some of the common learnings. Um, and I think uh, the examples like from uh, Robin, where she showed that they moved from ad hoc to comprehensive investment. And the example from Hakim in Indonesia, we saw what the absence of policy means that you get this ad hoc implementation, this inconsistent application and 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 poor quality walking environments. Whereas if you can in, embed that commitment and that that approach in governments, you start to see those those changes. And 
Um, I wonder then, I'm just giving people a chance to throw up a question, but there's none um, coming. I, I'll ask you then just in, to reflect from um, seeing those different presentations. Was there a particular thing like Rohit, yours was, was safety, um, but do you see that these comprehensive agendas are where um, governments are getting the motivation to do this, or do we still need to have a particular priority for governments to respond to? Does it help to have safety or like for that media campaigning? What, what's, what's prompting that initial engagement between advocacy groups and government? Um, so your example is very clear. It was around um, safety. But perhaps, Robin, we could come back to you. What was the trigger from the advocacy group? What were they asking for from the polit politician's perspective that actually got that political commitment in the election cycle? What was, what was the element or, or dimension of walking that they were asking for? Uh, as I understand it, the Queensland Walks uh, was seeking a, a walking strategy <laughs> as the starting point, and that was their... Uh, they managed to get a, a, an advisor to the Premier, I believe, who then uh, made it an election commitment. I mean, as the government still had to win for the election commitment to, or that party had to win for the election commitment to be, sure. be honoured, but then they did. So, yeah, so it was, but, you know, at the, at the, I was also going to say that, is it Margaret Mead who said something like the never underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the world, it's, in fact, it's so nothing. It, it's uh, the only thing that ever has. And yeah, it, Queensland Walks was just a small group of people. And uh, so I would, uh, so Hakim, you know, you're a small group of people. Keep working. <laughs> Yeah. And whereas we see in Singapore, probably the government hasn't needed um, helping. You probably haven't needed community advocacy to get the to get your work underway because you just had the sheer pressure of space and efficiency and, you know, managing the, the need to to deliver um, on that. I wonder, is there um, uh, is there any. Uh, link with the community or engagement or are you simply delivering on your agenda um, from, from a more sort of uh, transport government led approach? Yeah, so uh, moving on, uh, we, we would like to have more ground engagement. Uh, we are already doing that. that. Uh, so before uh, the pro uh, during the planning stage, as well as uh, prior to implementing, so we will engage the ground. Uh, so at the planning stage, we will uh, have some focus group discussion with the users to understand their needs, uh, understand their pain points. Then uh, we can tweak our design to accommodate their needs. Then uh, before pre-opening, again, uh, we will uh, engage our advisors, uh, the town advisors, uh, it, right? Uh, and also uh, public, uh, public uh, through exhibition, uh, through uh, meetings with them. Yeah, so uh, um, engagement to the ground is really, really important for us. So we are also moving towards uh, co-creating with them. Uh, for example, uh, uh, some of the our community partnership actually work with the ground. Um, where one uh, very uh, interesting aspect is uh, we get the school children to actually design the school signs uh, watch out for student crossing and then uh, yeah we, 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 we implement it with a sign uh, a real sign on the ground yeah to, to demonstrate their work as well and to create awareness so uh, that is very important to us as well yeah yeah it's really good to hear and I think the other thing that I I learned from your like what's something to learn from what you were working with is that when you're building new corridors you're building for the for the public transport for cycling and and walking and there are different models for that some people you know like but creating that full sort of corridor experience all in in one package rather than um uh like well say sorry queensland sorry robin but brisbane built busways but they're only for buses you know so they've built huge amounts of infrastructure uh, to move to move buses or you know and and i think sometimes when there's a pressure on space you have to be to be wiser to that. And I, I was really impressed um, with that. Um, there is a question here from Trang about asking a question verbally. 
Um, if that's you, Cheng, we're trying to um, be very quick. So if you promise me to be ask a very quick question, um, I'm happy to. But uh, otherwise, please drop it into the into the chat. Um, and the other question here was about e-scooters. And we haven't particularly touched on that. It is a vexed issue for, for many cities. Um, if, if you don't mind, I think it's Adrian. Um, it, is, it is a vexed issue, but perhaps we can, we can pick that up another day because we have only um, a few minutes. Unless any of my speakers have a really quick answer around how your cities are handling e-scooters. Anyone got a quick response to that? Uh, Queen, okay, so Robin's dropped something into the chat. Um, and in Singapore, they're putting, they're not allowed on footpaths. So it's an ongoing challenge, this. And I know even Paris is looking at what they, how they manage that. Um, but Train, did you want to ask a quick question verbally, just as a last person? Uh, thank you, Veron. Uh, yeah, thank you for all the way it brings a lot of the uh, present, uh, great, uh, presentation from different ones uh, to us. And um, I think that's a quick question um, I would like to add is uh, actually so I have a lot of questions, but maybe I limited it to uh, one is regarding to the traffic safety uh, in India. Um, yeah, because uh, in Vietnam, we also have a similar uh, situation and how I, I would like to know that how you can satisfy and you can convince the, the, the local government and um, to um, invest uh, and, and implement uh, this activity because in Vietnam is similar situation and very difficult to, to convince them. Every year we have uh, the campaign at the beginning of the, the school starting in the September. Uh, but then I think after one week, everything is to go back to the um, to the normal and then mm -hmm. parents is start like feeling the uncomfortable and unsafety for their children and start like bringing uh, their okay. uh, children okay. to the school yeah okay and, and so yeah, go on then. Quick second question. <laughs> yeah, the second question is uh, regarding to the um, uh, people. Um, uh, he answered talking about the, uh, he can count the 10 times people use the waiting box uh, for the pedestrian. Um, uh, so what is the methodology for it? Uh, did, did he really count things okay. before and after? Uh, yeah. Great, great. Yeah. Thanks, Train. That's great. So actually, Rohit, we'll just go straight to you then to talk about um, the sustaining the engagement or uh, um, and also then please talking about the measuring impact. Um, sure. um, if I understood correctly, the first question, um, how to sustain the um, uh, or how to how to make sure that the local government is um, investing into um, the project. So in the context of Mumbai, I can speak, um, is that every every um, year, um, a certain budget is allocated for uh, infrastructural development. Um, the city um, of Mumbai um, has, um, it is one of the richest municipality in Asia. Um, but so uh, there is a lot of budget, but a lot of times the city authorities or policymakers um, don't always know where to and how to invest it, what is exactly needed. So one of the mm. aspects why we focused on safety, because safety was the need um, in the context of Mumbai. Um, otherwise, what they were doing was just repaving the sidewalks or, uh, you know, repaving, uh, painting the curbs. Um, uh, you know, these were the interventions which were getting invested in. Um, and um, a very less um, attention was paid for uh, accessibility and safety considering vulnerable road users. Um, so that once a year budget, which comes to every politician who, who is in charge of that locality was our, uh, was the, was the system that we tapped into. And we reached out to that politician that, okay, you have this budget and you can invest this in this, this things. And these are going to have more impact than what you otherwise are doing. So that kind of helped us convincing them, um, uh, and a direct investment in the right, um, uh, for the right projects, which the community, which which have larger impact on the community, um, and the second question, I, if I understood correctly, was about um, how the impact assessment was done. Is that how, how did you measure the change for people? You know, the children standing and waiting to cross the road in the right place, and that sort of increase in behaviour change that came with your investment right. in your installation. 
Right, got it. So, um, so in the for this particular project, we had um, two levels of assessment. One was intercept survey um, to understand what how people react, and second was observations. Um, and throughout the trial, we had like cameras located um, before the trial and during the trial. So that helped us understand how users, are, where users are crossing, how many uh, users are stopping. Uh, before um, you know they cross um, on the on the pedestrian crossings, uh, especially the vehicle users. So this this kind of helped us understand how um, the users are behaving, and this also helped us to understand understand crash conflict. So before the trial, how many near misses were there, and during the trial, how many less um, near misses or how many more near misses are occurring. Um, and that assessment helped us to then go back to the design board or the drawing board and rectify our design based on that assessment. So um, these two processes were used for this particular project. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, camera tool is a yeah, user phone. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tran, uh, for the question. And thank you, Rohit. Um, it is time we are finished. I am going to wrap up on time um, because I do appreciate that uh, it's it's it, it's of value to all of us. I think I want to finish with this impact question because I think this is so critical. We've been saying it for years in War 21. Please measure, please evaluate, please come and report on impact and success and, and outcomes so that we can build on those things. And I think we see that now. We really see that deep evaluation of, of interventions and, and progress. And with um, some of the like leaders like Singapore, like Queensland, like um, the WRI and Bloomberg initiatives around the different points and different interventions that you're doing and the ambition that you have for, for walking. Um, every time I think I'm starting to get a bit tired of this job and I might put my feet up for a while, I get inspired by the work that everybody is doing globally. And I think the platform, this Pathways to Walkable Communities, we plan to grow and to enlarge, to continue to um, highlight and to celebrate the, the work that people are doing and for this cross-learning um, so that people can see the individual interventions, but also those comprehensive packages that we need. So it just leaves me to say thank you to our speakers, particularly particularly to Hakim for coming in literally at the very last minute, putting together a presentation and sharing your experience from Indonesia. We do appreciate that. Thank you to the LTA. Thank you to Rohit and thank you to, uh, to, to, to Robin and the Queensland government for, for that and for Palping for sharing with us today. We really appreciate your inputs. Thank you all for joining us. Look forward to hearing from you and continuing this conversation with our platforms. We're talking with Europe and Africa later this morning and then to the Americas this afternoon afternoon and it is deeply inspiring I think there is genuine momentum around this and we look forward to continuing that and uh, sharing more news from the platform as we go thanks a lot